Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ. So this is John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, and at this stage John has been imprisoned. And uh, we know the story that, that John's not going to make it out of prison. John will eventually be beheaded, but he's in prison. And it says this, it says that when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, so John's in prison and he hears the things that Jesus is doing. So he's in prison and, and, and people are, are coming in and visiting uh, or maybe he's hearing guards talking about this Jesus of Nazareth and what's going on. He's hearing about the works, the activities, the things that Jesus is doing while he's in prison. And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go and, 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 and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. It's a very interesting story. John the Baptist is in prison and he hears what Jesus is doing. And so he sends two of his disciples, his followers, his apprentices, and he says, go and find Jesus and ask him this question, are you the Messiah that we've been waiting for or should we be looking for somebody else? In other words, is this a work of God or is it something else? It's weird because go back a few chapters, there's nobody in the scriptures that I come across who had such incredible faith that this was the Messiah even the disciples that walked with him struggled and didn't fully get it. John the Baptist knew who he was before anybody else knew who he was. This is the same John that's at the river baptizing people. And then he looks up and he sees a man walking towards him. And he boldly declares to everybody present, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Messiah as Jesus is walking towards him. He gets in the water to be baptised. John is so convinced that this is Jesus, the Messiah, this is the manifestation of God, that he says, you should baptise me. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's right that we do it this way and you need to baptise me. When he's baptised, we don't know whether it was natural eyes or what, but what we do know is this. John was so convinced because he says later on that I saw the Spirit descend upon him like a dove and stay there. So he he saw something, and it was, he describes it as the Holy Spirit like a dove. He didn't say the Holy Spirit was a dove. Okay, So if you're shopping and the Holy Spirit, a dove lands on a, on a, on a shopping trolley, don't, it's not a sign from God, whatever you're doing, right? It's, it's just symbolic. He says it was like a dove. But he was so convinced, and he said, I saw this. He also said, I heard a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist was so incredibly convinced that this was the manifestation of God, that this was God, that Jesus was the Messiah. Fast forward a little bit, and all of a sudden, now he's beginning to sort of second guess. He's not sure. He's not sure. And so he calls two of his disciples and says, go and ask him the question, are you actually the one that we've been waiting for, or should we be waiting for somebody else? Does anybody else strike that as strange? To be so incredibly confident that he was the Son of God, to be so incredibly confident that this was what God was doing in their day and age, and then all of a sudden, after he hears the works of Jesus, it says that he was fine until he heard the works of Jesus. Everybody has a theological box, don't we? If we're humble and honest... Everyone in this room has a theological box. We have a box that we kind of place who God is and what God does inside of. And every now and then, God does things outside of that box. Anyone ever have God do something outside your theological box? You, you, just, you didn't have a framework for it, yet something happened. And 
I remember being in a meeting once with, uh, in, in Youth with a Mission back in the 1990s, early 90s. And it was, a, it was a really weird season where the Holy Spirit turned up in incredible manifestations. And one particular manifestation happened right beside me. I'm standing here in a tent worshipping God. And I looked off to the left of me and about one row behind me, there was a girl called Samantha. And Samantha is standing there and she's worshipping God. And as I turned and glanced, Samantha was lifted off the ground, laid that way and flew through the air two rows of chairs backwards, landed with the small of her back on the top of a chair and just bounced like a rubber band, flexed down, sprung up, landed on a face on the grass and mud in this particular tent where we were and burst into incredible laughter. Samantha had a really rough background. She came from down south and her childhood was not very kind to her. She experienced a lot of things that children shouldn't. And as a result of that, she had all this anxiety and was bound up with a whole bunch of emotional problems and pains. And she'd been through some YWAM training. <coughs> this was a secondary school. So she'd done a six-month, what they call discipleship training school. And, and she'd been through uh, a whole bunch of experiences and church and counselling and so on. And nothing had really cracked the code that would set her free. I watched her hit the ground, burst into laughter, and stand up totally free of all this emotional bondage that she had carried around her life from things that had happened, trauma as a child. That's outside my theological box. Um, as a matter of fact, it makes me a little bit angry. I think, God, why am I still dealing with some of these things all these years later from my childhood? Just throw me over a chair, snap my back, and hit me on the ground. It would be over nice and quick. Just do that for me. But he's never done that for me. But Samantha, this happened. And that was just one of many things that began to happen around me that were definitely outside my theological framework, outside my theological box. And every one of us have a theological box. Most of our boxes are usually determined by what we've experienced or what we've not experienced in our walk with God. So we all love Jesus and we all want everything God's got for us. We've also got a framework for what that looks like and what fits inside the box is God and what's outside the box is not God. And you know what? It's actually very wise to have a framework for God, by the way. Having a box, a theological box, is not a bad thing. In fact, I think it's encouraged. It's a good thing to have. But how do we know whether something is of God or something is not of God? Is it not of God because it sits outside your box? Is it definitely of God just because it fits inside your box? What's the method that you use and I use to determine what's actually of God and what's actually not of God? It's a really, really important question, especially when we begin, as we have been, to be talking for about 12 weeks now about the Holy Spirit. And we're not talking about the Holy Spirit, his activities, his actions, his gifts, his power, just for the sake of going over a topic and going, great, we've covered that topic, let's move on to the next one. We're talking about the Holy Spirit and his activity and his power and the endowments and the gifts he gives to us because we're meant to do something with them. The Holy Spirit is meant to be an integral part of our journey. His fruit is meant to not be a topic we discuss but something that cultivates and becomes evident in our life. His gifts and his power are not just a topic we read about or something we go to church and hear a message about. They're meant to be a part of our Christian journey and a part of our Christian experience. Now, the problem with that is that how many of you have ever been in a meeting or known a person or have a story or a situation where something that was proclaimed to be of God maybe got a little weird, wacky and ended up on the scrap heap. Anyone ever been? Yep, a couple of people do this because we're afraid to be brutally honest and just throw your hand in the air. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, in First John, John writes and he encourages his, the guy reading, he encourages, he says this, he says, I want you to test the spirits. Not every spirit comes from God. How many of you know that there are two spiritual realities active on planet Earth today? One of them, we're in here worshipping. One of them we're lifting up. One of, them, one of them we want more and more of in our life. Amen? Who wants more of God? 
Okay, it's a funny phrase, I want more of God. I've got everything of God. The real, real thing is that God wants more of me. That's really it. We say I want more of the Holy Spirit. I think it's more the Holy Spirit wants more of us. And that's where discipleship comes into play. That's where maturity and growth and dealing with our issues and trust and faith, they're all things that unpack the stuff inside of us and open us up more to be used by God and for God and to become who God wants us to become. So there's that spiritual side of life that, that the Holy Spirit inhabits that we want. But there's another side to life as well. Who knows that? There's another side to life and there's another spiritual dimension. And we call him Satan, the devil. Jesus had many encounters where the Spirit of God came up against the Spirit of, of the enemy. Yeah? The good news is that the Spirit of God always wins. The Spirit of God trumps anything else. God comes out on top. But there are many, many situations and circumstances where temporarily God didn't come out on top because people didn't test the spirits. Or because people weren't discerning. And maybe it's because we don't know how. I mean, how do you know what's of God and what's not of God? How do we know what to let inside our box? How do we know if something outside the box... How many of you know things outside the box can be God? So I can't just make my theological box be the thing that determines whether something's of God or something's of, not of God. I would have missed out on a lot of things if I put everything that I didn't think was in my box that happened outside my box and called it not God. I would have missed out on a lot of great opportunities. I would have missed out on a lot of growth in my life. How many of you have had things that, 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 that just seem outside of the framework that you have, but in hindsight you look back and you go, no, that was actually God. And maybe even at the time I resisted it and thought that it wasn't God, but in hindsight I look back and I go, no, that really, really was God. So we're encouraged to open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit. We're encouraged to open ourselves up to the reality that life is more than you can see, taste, touch, feel and smell. We're not only encouraged that there's more to life than that, we're encouraged to engage with that side of life as well. Because we're not just natural people having a spiritual experience, as some have termed it. We're spiritual beings having a natural experience. When I came to faith, my spirit came alive. When I came to faith, the very spirit of the invisible God came and dwelled inside of me and is in union with my spirit now. That's not normal. That's supernatural. That's something outside the norm. John the Baptist has a situation here where he thinks he knows what God looks like. He thinks he knows what is a work of God and he thinks Jesus is that manifestation of God. But then he hears what Jesus is doing and now he's questioning Hang on a second. There, uh, this doesn't fit inside my box. The reason why I believe it's okay to have a theological box is because I think John the Baptist was pretty cool and he had one. And I don't mind saying, I've got one too. But my theological box is not something that has necessarily been established by God. It's been established by me. It's my criteria. Perhaps it's what I'm comfortable with. Perhaps it's what I'm not comfortable with. Perhaps it's, it's what I've experienced or grown up with in my church life or maybe it's what I've been told from day dot was not God and so you stay away from it. So I want to know, how do you tell what's actually of God and what's actually not of God? What's the litmus test? You know, back in the, back in the um, sort of 90s, I don't know if, if many of you would... would Remember, you probably would, those of you that have been around church for a while, there was some uh, a big move of God back in the 90s and it hit several churches throughout the Western world and sort of splintered all around the world. It started um, as a part of, of the Vineyard Movement. And, uh, you know, God was doing some amazing things and, uh, you know, people were, were, were having genuine encounters with the Holy Spirit and uh, began this sort of renewal, revival, whatever you want to call it, that, that, that branched out from Toronto Airport Vineyard. It went to to um, Brownsville. Anyone remember with the Brownsville revival? It was happening while we were living in India <coughs> and then um, uh, went on to uh, Lakewood as well. There was a move of God, uh, well-documented moves of God in these particular churches. And uh, what, what happened was that these movements began to get a bit of traction and people began to hear about the manifestations of what was going on in these places. So people started travelling from everywhere to go along to some of these places because they heard of the, the manifestations and stuff that was going on. And, and uh, you know, there were all, all kinds of, of, of things uh, that happened in those places. There were, 
You know, anyone ever remember falling over when you were prayed for and people used to fall? Anyone remember those days? No, I'm the only one. Yep. And uh, to preempt that, because we knew it was going to happen, there would be a catcher behind you. Um, to sort of preempt that. And then uh, there was uh, laughter, and there was lots of laughter. Rodney Howard Brown meetings, there was lots of laughter and people laughing. And look, I've got no doubt that uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I can find a, a bit of a basis perhaps for, for, for joy as being a, a manifestation of the Spirit and so on. And, um, you know, there, was, there were people being set free and there was, there was all kinds of great things happening. But eventually, uh, those movements went a little bit too far if I can be bold. And I'm only saying that in light of what I'm going to tell you, I believe, are the tests, I guess, for what is actually a genuine uh, manifestation of God. And I'm not just talking about in a corporate meeting, but I'm talking about in your own personal world. How do you know that that experience, that encounter, that moment you're having is God? How do you know? Well, we need to know and we're encouraged to know. Here's what what the writers of of, of Scripture had to say about what's going to happen in the latter days. Matthew 24, verse 23 to 24, Jesus said this. He said, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So there will be manifestations, signs, wonders, miracles. There's going to be all kinds of things that are not just going to be done by God and God's people, but there's going to be people on the other side of the spiritual fence who are going to be doing this sort of stuff as well. And the goal is to deceive and to drag you away. That's what it literally means, to pull you away from where God wants you to be. Jesus said that this is going to come. By the way, when he says there will be false Christ, that word Christ actually means anointed. It actually means anointed. It's not Jesus' last name. Jesus was the anointed Messiah, the one that came that was anointed Messiah. But Jesus is saying there'll be other false anointings, people that come or claim this is an anointing of God, this is a manifestation of God. It's going to happen. And the goal of it is to be deceived and pull us away. Basically to pull us away from the true and the genuine of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our world. Who wants the true and genuine of the Holy Spirit? I do, because that's where life is. That's where freedom is. That's where liberty is. That's where I will find healing and wholeness. That's where I will find all that, that I need to become who I'm meant to become and to do what I'm called to do. In Second Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10, <coughs> Paul writes this. He says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception. So again, Paul's saying that there's going to be signs and wonders. In other words, there are going to be manifestations that will come, but they're not going to be of God. And they're going to have a goal. It's unrighteous deception. Again, pull you away so that you get off track and off center with what is true and what is real. What's true and what's real. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 2, Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says, then in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. Giving heed to deceiving spirits. So it's very, very clear from the writings of these ancient documents that there's these two spiritual things going on. One is of God, and it's there to give you life, build you up, and to help you become who you're meant to be, and, and to empower us to do the mission that we're called to do, which is to go into all the world and make disciples. But there's another spiritual dimension as well that's going to come on in, that's going to try to bring deception and pull the church away. I go back and I look at those, those, those churches back in the 90s. It, it, that move of God culminated in a, a particular moment. Now, I don't want to get bogged down on it, I don't, and I'm not going to use names. But a particular moment, all of the... Um, remember there was the apostolic movement, a prophetic movement. We had uh, people that believed they were, were called of God and they were the apostles. And there was an actual movement set up, apostolic and prophetic movement, that oversaw all of God's activity in the world. And these people gathered together to commission a particular man who was a part of these revivals who turned up and started praying for people and all kinds of manifestations started to happen. And these manifestations went on to such a degree that all these prophets and apostles from all around the Western world flew together and happened to land in a particular place at the same time, declared publicly, and and you can find it on YouTube, declared publicly, this is a work of God, it's a miracle of God that we all got here at the same time and so on, and, and really talked it up, and then they proclaimed and declared over this particular man as as they were the apostles that they could proclaim over him that this is what was going to happen here's what they said i take the apostolic authority that god has given me and i decree it to you blah your power will increase 
Your authority will increase, your favour will increase, your influence will increase. We also decree that a new supernatural strength will flow through this ministry. A new life force will penetrate this move of God. Government will be established to set things in their proper order. God will pour out a higher level of discernment to distinguish truth from error. New relationships will surface to open the gates for the future. Two months later, the guy they commissioned left his wife, had been having an affair right up to the commissioning time. It was his assistant that he was having an affair with. And all these people stood up on stage and apparently nobody had the discernment to know. Nobody had a check, nobody had any idea. And you can imagine what that did to the church world. And you can imagine when the media got a hold of that, of course, what happened with that. My point is this, Jesus said even the elect are open to deception. Even the elect, even the best of the best are open to deception. You know, I stand here uh, on, on, on Sundays and I'm, you know, I, I actually believe that the Holy Spirit wants to do something. I'm not just talking here. I go back and look at, at church history and, and what's happened in the modern world. And something happened in that moment when those revivals, if you go back to those particular churches now, some of them are in millions of dollars debt today. I don't see that as a God thing. That's outside my box. Maybe I could be wrong, but I don't think God wants uh, his churches and his people to be in millions of dollars debt. Some of them are down to two, three hundred people now. They were running at 20, 30,000. Two, three hundred people. Pastors have left. There have been splits amongst the leadership now and new churches have started but failed. And many leaders and people that attended these, they no longer, including leaders and pastors, don't even fellowship anymore. Not even sure if they're walking with God. Somewhere something was wrong. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 4 says this. It says that, that God appoints some as apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, so on. And the mandate for them is not to do all the ministry, by the way. The mandate of that fivefold gifting is to, to equip or furnish the saints for the work of ministry. It, we're saints. We're saints. In other words, the work of ministry is carried on by us. Okay. Let me just tell you point blank, you are a minister. You are a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody in this room. And part of my job is to equip you. It's not just to entertain you. I've been there and done that and got the T-shirt. I used to be a really great entertainer. You know I mean, those of you that, that were in, with me in the past, not here at Arise, but my previous experience, I was a good entertainer. I really was. I, I would spend almost as much time on my jokes as I did on my theology. <laughs> Matter of fact, I spent more time on my jokes than I did theology. As long as I had a couple of points that were kind of theolo theologically okay, the jokes had to be right. It's sick. I look back on it now and I go, it's really, really sick. It's really, really sick. Because we're actually called to equip, not entertain. And so when you come here on a Sunday, I'm hoping you come here to be equipped for the work of ministry. Equipped to do something for the kingdom of God. Equipped to make a difference for the eternal kingdom of God. And, and, and I'm hoping that everybody that gets up here and stands here and shares with you, that that's what they want to do too. We're not here waving our own flag or we just want to equip. And I feel like God wants to do something. See, I, I, something happened in the 90s with that move of the Spirit. And it was that there are some people that moved so far away because they were so burnt by that experience and so burnt by what happened there that they want nothing to do with the Holy Spirit anymore. And the minute somebody stands up and does this, they're out of the door. It's gone. Because we don't want to go there again because we were burnt and we were hurt. And so we need to learn how to discern some of these things before they get out of control. And you see, quite often these movements... Get out of control. Have you ever heard anybody say that the reason that the revival died is because man got involved? Anyone ever heard that? Because man got involved. Let me say this. It's kind of a stupid thing to say. If men weren't there in the first place, there wouldn't have been a revival, so men were involved from the start. And if you go back and you look at moves of God, it's not going to happen by men stepping aside and going, God, do whatever you want. That leads to anarchy and craziness. Part of the call of God for leadership is to govern and guide and direct and and keep things on an even keel. Discern what's God and what's not. Not be afraid every now and then to speak up and go, we just don't believe that's 
Right. Let, let, me, let me read to you something that I, I, I got sent to me this week. If I can find it up here, I might not have it. Here we go. John Wimber. Who, who, who's heard of John Wimber? Great, great uh, mover in signs and wonders. As a matter of fact, really, really sort of, I, I guess, reopened the Western church's uh, eyes to the fact that the Holy Spirit really wants to do supernatural things, that the gifts can flow through everybody and so on. He was a, he was a bit of a revolutionary. And, and where this, this movement in the 90s at the, the, a particular church in Canada there, uh, things got out of control. So God was moving and things were happening. Fast forward a long story short, um, by the end of it, there were guys walking around on all fours with somebody behind them with a dog chain, barking like dogs, and they were all rejoicing that that was the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, but that's a little weird. How do I know that's weird? Well, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. I mean, hopefully I don't have to tell you why that's weird, but anyway. They ended up with these weird things. People screaming, uh, r- running with the fire of God upon them. Anyone ever seen that Talladega Nights? I'm not recommending it. But uh, there's a scene where the guy has a car crash and he's not on fire, but he runs around like he's on fire. He thinks he's on fire and he's screaming, but there's no flames. There were people running around in the auditoriums, literally running, blood-curdling screams and people laughing, going, oh, it's the fire of God. And I'm thinking, gosh, I don't want to go too far with it, but... And I know there may be people here that think I'm being judgmental and critical. I've prayed about this and I'm prepared to say it anyway because I feel like it's part of what we need to do. We need to, 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 to sort of govern and guide. And I'm not judging any human beings. And I'm not saying these movements weren't of God. I'm just saying that at some point they were not governed right. Here's what John Wimber wrote in his letter where they withdrew their endorsement of a particular vineyard church in Toronto. They said, We cannot at any time endorse, encourage offer theological justification or biblical proof texting for any exotic practices that are extra-biblical, whether in Toronto or elsewhere. Neither can these practices be presented as criteria for true spirituality or as a mark of true renewal. Our position is that the renewing works of the Spirit are authenticated by that which is clearly stated in Scripture as works of the kingdom. Though we understand that when the kingdom is manifest among us, there may be phenomena that we do not understand. It's our conviction that these manifestations should not be promoted, placed on stage, nor used as the basis for theologizing that leads to new teaching. In other words, what he's saying is there is a criteria and this movement has moved outside the criteria and we need to disassociate ourselves from it. My thought is, wouldn't it be so much better if, if the ministers, the lay people, congregations, call yourselves whatever you want, your missionaries, if we all understood somewhat of a biblical framework and could make those judgments instead of waiting and sitting back till things get out of control, hoping that there's going to be a leader there that's going to come along and say, no, that's not right. Wouldn't it be great if we all knew what we were looking for in terms of trying to judge what's a move of God and what's not? Okay. I'm going to scrap a lot of stuff here and I'm going to move straight to the point. What is it that we can look for that can tell us whether something is truly a work of the Spirit or not. Apart from the manifestations, a lot of movements have gotten into trouble just as they did with this particular preacher that they stood up and prophesied over and said he was going to be the next thing to usher in what God was doing and two months later. We can't seek manifestations. We're never encouraged in the Bible to seek manifestations. You know what I mean by that? Seek laughter. I want the holy laughter. Ooh, I want the falling down when you pray. I want... The We're never encouraged to seek manifestations. Okay? That's not the criteria for whether something is of God. That's what gets us in trouble. God did that once and that must always be God. Maybe it's not. We're never encouraged to seek a criteria of manifestations. So what are we to seek for? Well, I think that Jesus gave us the answer in Matthew chapter 11. Here's what Jesus said. Just go back over. Can you put that back up on the screen for me, Luke? Matthew chapter 11. He says this. Jesus says, go back to John. Tell him what you have seen and tell him what you've heard. The two criteria that Jesus gives us there is this. Number one, he says, tell him what you've seen. What's he saying? He's saying, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. 
Jesus says the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk. People are getting the, oh, isn't that funny? I've, I've, I've left the letter, it says the poo, hear the gospel. It's meant to be the poor, but anyway. <laughs> I must pay more attention when I'm typing notes out. The poo, hear the gospel. <laughs> the poor hear the gospel. Here's the thing. Jesus straight away says he wants to know whether this is of God. Go back and tell him the fruit. Here's the fruit. The, 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 the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame are walking, and the poor are having the good news preached to them. Look at the fruit. What's the fruit of this particular thing that's happening right now? Now, sometimes fruit's not seen for a little bit, but fruit is part of the criteria that Jesus says, hey, go back and tell him, check out the fruit. The fruit of some of that stuff in the 90s began pretty good. It got to a point where the fruit began to get very weird and loopy. And it's at that point that leaders should have stepped in and gone, that's going too far, or that people themselves should have gone, I'm not going there because that's going a little bit too far. Examine the fruit. Look at the fruit because the fruit will tell you something about whether something really is of God. This girl in YWAM, remember I told you the story, she went smack bang and flapped over and hit the ground. I can tell you she got up from that moment and the fruit in her life was absolutely phenomenal. She was like she had gone from this person in a moment to being that person. The fruit was evident in her life straight away. Sometimes, yes, fruit takes time, but we have to look at the fruit because Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. Jesus said a good tree only bears good fruit. It can't bear bad fruit. He said a bad tree is only going to bear bad fruit. A bad tree, it can't bear good fruit. So he said fruit is one of the ways that you examine whether what's going on is of God or not. Not just corporately in terms of manifestations. What about your own world, things that happen in your own life? Who's had some weird, freaky experiences with the Holy Spirit? I have. I've had a couple of moments in my life and... and, and they're outside my box. But what I do is I go back to the criteria I'm talking to you about and I look at the criteria and they fit the criteria. I remember uh, just before, before I got saved, um, somebody told me, I, I started hearing about this Jesus character when I was 12. That was the first time I heard. By about 15, um, I bumped into some Christian people and began some friendships with some people that didn't culminate, uh, culminate until 19 when I actually gave my life to Jesus at 19. But... I remember one night laying in bed and I'm laying in bed and the bottom left hand corner of my blanket and sheet was lifted up. This, this happened true as I'm standing here. It lifted up and this wind blew in under the blankets and blew over my body up and down. A second time came up and down. And I'm 15. I don't know Jesus and this is freaking me out as it would. But a funny thing popped into my mind. Just relax. This could be God. I don't know where it came from. I can't tell you where it came from. But it blew in, up, and down. And the second time, up and down. A third time, up and then down. Out the left-hand corner of my sheets. And then the bed just kind of folded back over like normal. This happened to me three times in the space of about six months. Three times in the space of six months. What is that? Well... If I run it through the criteria that I'm talking to you about, you know what the fruit of that was? I didn't see it instantaneously, but the fruit of that experience is that I'm actually standing here today doing what I'm doing. It all came from that experience back then. And for whatever reason, I had this weird encounter with God where the Holy Spirit just blew up and down, up and down, up and down, and disappeared. Can I find that in the Bible word for word that that actually happened to somebody? I can't find anywhere. I've tried. There's nowhere where it says David was asleep at night and the bottom left-hand corner of the sheets opened up and a breeze blew up and down his body and blew back out. I can't find it. It's not there. And if you can find it, come and educate me, please. I'm open to learn. But I had an experience with God. And I look at the fruit from that experience now and it's awesome. I know that I'm doing something and I know that God's got a place in my world and I go back to that and I know that I know that I know now that that moment, that experience was the Holy Spirit. I knew it because at the moment, the peace that came upon me. I knew it because when it happened, something inside of me switched my focus and attention to God when I began to panic. 
It wasn't fear. God doesn't give me a spirit of fear, but of love, peace, and a sound mind. And my mind, I began to panic, and I was taken straight to a place. I didn't know that at the time because I didn't know the Bible, and I didn't know God. But I had this encounter with God, and the fruit of it is that I'm doing what I'm doing today with my life. I've had a couple of other encounters that were a little bit outside, and I match them by the same criteria. So the first criteria is the fruit. The second criteria is the most important criteria, and it's the word. The fruit and the word. When Jesus said to John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Every one of those statements are taken from the prophet Isaiah when Isaiah spoke prophetically about the Messiah who was to come. It wasn't just that Jesus randomly said these things. He spoke about the fruit, but he also said to John the Baptist, if you go back to the Word and have a look, you'll see in there that this is of God. Isaiah, I think it's 35, uh, 25, 61. Uh, If you go back and look at those passages, you will find all these statements. So when John the Baptist got that message, he would have known straight away that's what Isaiah said about the one that was to come. So the two criteria that we need to run things through is A, we need to examine the fruit, and B, we need to examine the word. Is it in line with the word of God? Now, when I say is it in line with the word of God, I am not saying that the word of God will have a sentence that explains every experience that we have, because that's impossible. There's nothing in there that talks about the breeze blowing up and down my body. It's just not in there, and you're not going to find it. Some years later, after being a a pastor for several years in Balna, and then resigning from that particular church, and then going out and finding other employment, I got up one night to go to the toilet. I woke up, and I remember getting out of bed. I walked down my bed. I got to the foot of my bed, and as I did, light filled our bedroom. Jackie was asleep. Light filled the bedroom like I've never, ever seen light in my life. I've never experienced it. I literally fell face first on the bed, unable to move any limb of my body. It was weird. Unable to move any limb of my body. And I'm laying there with this light above me. And I was just filled with an incredible reverence and sense of God, like I have never been filled with before and have never been filled with after. And as I laid there, this verse came, bang, straight into my mind. The hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. And I literally laid there as if I had melted like an ice cream in the sun. Just, I just went, blah. And I'm just laying there with this light. And this verse is running through my brain. And then all these stories, these, these pictures of the glory of God in the Old Testament. When God's presence would come, what would happen? you would find that whole nations would end up prostrate on the ground before God. Now, I go back to that experience and I run it through my greed of fruit and word. Well, is it in the word? Well, yes, it is. Because when the presence of God turns up, I see people falling on their faces getting prostrate before God. I I find in the Psalms that the hills melt like wax in the presence of God. There's something about God's true presence when it comes in that heavy weight that you can't stand, you can't pray, you can't do anything when the glory of God comes like that. Up until then, I was used to thinking that the glory of God was just, you know, someone would stand up and go, oh, do you feel the glory? Do you feel the glory in the room, brother? And people would go, amen, yeah, I do. You know what? I can't do that anymore. What's the fruit of it? I can't do that anymore. I can't do it anymore. The glory of God means something so different to me now. I don't play, I don't feel like I can, I'm not saying people are playing with it, but I have a real deep reverence and fear of God when it comes to his glory. Because when his glory fell in that room that day, I was completely out of the picture. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't talk, couldn't twitch a finger, couldn't scratch. That was the glory of God. That was my experience. Do I find it in the word? Yes, I do. And what was the fruit? Well, the fruit is I've, I've, I've got a much greater reverence for the presence of God from that moment on than I ever had before. Even though I'd heard people teach about it and so on, God gave me an encounter with the Spirit, an experience. But I run it through this grid of fruit and word, which is exactly what Jesus said to John's disciples. Go back 
and tell him, here's the fruit, and it lines up with the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13 to 17. Paul writes this. He says, Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's that word again, deceiving and being deceived. He says, But Timothy, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood, watch this, from childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures. In other words, you've known the Word of God. What you've heard, what you've learned has come out of these ancient documents. You've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally means all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every good work. He says the way, Timothy, that you're going to be able to stand against deception and being deceived, he says, know the word of God and stand on it. Know the word of God and stand on it. Know the word of God and stand on it. I had a really good friend of mine that worked with me and Jackie many years ago. His name was Alan as well. And we were running a youth group in Bundaberg and Alan was our assistant. He was helping us. Anyway, one day Alan decided that the Spirit had spoken to him. And what he was to do was to not go to work, but to lock himself in a room in his house and turn on the televangelist. This was back in the day when there were televangelists on for six hours a day. And so he would make a coffee in the morning, kiss his wife, go into a room, shut the door, and then spend six hours in isolation by himself listening to televangelists. Well, this then became a daily habit every single day, week after week, month after month. Eventually, he started having the presence of God turn up in the room where he was and started giving him visions. The Apostle Paul began to show up and have conversations with him and teach him things. And then the Apostle Paul started giving him messages that he needed to go around Bundaberg and give to all the other pastors. So he would rock up to pastors and he would say to them, the Apostle Paul appeared to me and told me to come and tell you this. Cut a long story short, it, ended his ma- it ruined his marriage. Um, his, 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 his sons, who were beautiful boys, were turned off God and he ended up in a psychiatric ward in the hospital. And I go back and I say, if you had have run that experience through some kind of grid... And if you ran it through the grid of fruit and the word, well, first of all, the word of God's never going to tell you to isolate yourself from the rest of the faith community. The Holy Spirit's not going to tell you to isolate yourself. And the word of God, I can't find anywhere there where the Apostle Paul's turning up to people, giving them visions. And when I look at the fruit of it, you destroyed a family. You, you, you tarnish the image of your particular church and your particular community. Why? Don't seek manifestations. We need to have a grid. What's our grid? Our grid is the fruit and our grid is the word. They're not the only thing Scripture tells us to run it through. But I just want to encourage us this morning that as we pursue the Holy Spirit, and I want us to pursue the Spirit, and I'm not just talking about here, I'm talking about in your own life. Really go after the gifts and the power and the presence of God in your life and in your world. But I want to also encourage you that as we pursue that, it's not an open slather, everything that happens is God. The, the dove lands on the shopping trolley while I'm thinking of leaving my wife, it's a sign from God that I should leave my wife. No, it's not. Go to the word of God. Think about the fruit. It's not a sign from God. People have made dumb, dumb decisions in church history and you probably know some of them and maybe some of you are them because you didn't have a grid through which you filtered something to know whether this was actually of God or whether it was not of God. They are not the only two criteria, but I think they're important enough because that's what Jesus said to John the Baptist when John the Baptist said, is this of God? He said, here's the fruit, and he said, you'll find it in the word of God. Does that make sense? Amen.